Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. We're sitting now with British Ambassador to the Philippines, Asif Ahmad. He, he'll talk to us about the Philippines' last elections, our first social media elections, our first social media president, and the challenges ahead. How can we use social media and technology to help foster inclusive growth? Ambassador Ahmad, thank you for joining us here in Rappler. Well, it's good to see you. I was almost tempted to say good afternoon, but of course in the digital world, it could be anything anywhere in the world. Correct, correct. And you are very savvy on social media. So, so let's tell us, what role did you see social media playing in these elections? Well, you know, if you'd asked me three years ago when I first arrived here and you said that this country was going to have a social media election, I would have said maybe that was a premature statement. I think we talked about this. Be <laughs> yeah, because I think social media here, my impression was it was used for fun. You know, people were posting pictures of themselves, that they're going out, the, the selfie culture, of which I've been a happy p participant here. Right. Um, that, it, that these things were more for fun c communications rather than something with a, with a serious intent, because I didn't see the things that we've seen in other parts of the world where internet-based trading is, 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 is very much uh, up there or delivery of, of services by right. businesses and others. So it came as a welcome surprise, but it is, it is here because um, what we saw was a campaign run on less uh, traditional lines, in, right. including funding, uh, a message both in person and through the media that was very, very direct. Right. And it sort of was apparent that people were feeling the real pulse of, of the population. It was, you could almost hear the audible hiss of, the, of, of people. Uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if your laptop or, or uh, uh, tablet could speak audibly, it would do that because you could feel that sort of buzz going through both ways. And the results, positive or negative? I mean, no, I think it, it is, it's positive in a sense that uh, one can actually analyze better what was the, the, the impact, you know, what, what uh, you, you talked to me, in, in fact educated me on this idea of big data. And you can actually see it, you know, as soon as you see traffic uh, on a particular issue, on a particular individual, and it caught many of the traditional uh, politicians very much flat-footed. Yes. Uh, they thought that it was still about rallies, it was about colors, it was about uh, whose hand you shook and uh, what your hand contained when you shook that hand. Um, and, and people s suddenly said, no, hold on, this is, this is actually different. Yeah. And, and as a result of that, I think the, even the formal narrative of what people were saying, the, the issues were different. I, I remember sitting next to a, a, a Filipino watching, and when one of the candidates started talking about what it feels like going through customs, where if you're a big shot, you're a way you through. through yeah. And as soon as you're some poor person bringing your balik bang box, uh, what's in there, what's f for me? Right. And, and the, the very easy line was, no Filipino should be treated that way. Now that just is direct, it's a message, and everybody feels what that is. It doesn't matter whether it's customs or immigration or w waiting in line in, in, a, in a shop. Right. The other day, um, somebody was waiting to go into one of the big uh, malls here, very much an upmarket mall, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the opening time was strictly 11. There were three Filipinos waiting mm. to go in. Mm. An expat walks through, morning ma'am, and doors open, and it's still 15 minutes before opening time. But nowadays, people fight back to say, what was that all about? Right. Uh, so I think mm. that's the sort of reality that we're now sort of seeing channeled through uh, the, the mouth of a politician, whereas beforehand it would have been a slogan, uh, whether it's uh, one path or the, the, the left or right message, uh, it was canned in a different way. Yes. It, it, in the past, it had to be polished to show, experience showed polish, right? Yeah. And it seemed now that it was the opposite. I mean, our president-elect, Rudy Duterte, uh, many people said he was elected because he was authentic. He said the things that, and this is positive or negative, he said yeah. the things you weren't supposed to say, but that they were, they were the way things are. I mean, again, that's quite controversial. How would you describe the Philippines today with our new leadership? Well, uh, a while back, uh, I was asked on, on television, what are, what are the best uh, attributes of a, of a Filipino? And I said, because people here are forgiving and they're patient. The follow-up question was, and what's the worst attribute mm -hmm. of a Filipino? I said, the same, patience and, and forgiving. I think that has finally run out and run thin. Yeah, that's uh, because what people are saying is, well, why should I forgive you if you've had uh, economic growth uh, in, in uh, uh, second only to China, uh, uh, and yet you know, I'm waiting for 
transport? Why, why should I wait for a job? Why should I have to go and join 11 million Filipinos uh, to, to make a living? And uh, people can compare what life is like in, in, in nearby. Uh, you know, if you look at ASEAN itself, yes. uh, countries that were back markers are, are on the shoulder of Philippines and sometimes running past the Philippines. Yes. Even the su subject matter of what we are using now, the internet, there is no reason on earth why the internet here should be one of the slowest the in the world. The connectivity issues, yes. Uh, yes. And yet you have an in entire industry, the, the BPO industry, that is so, so reliant on it. So uh, forgiveness is on, 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 on the, on the uh, wane, and so is patience. Because uh, I think anybody voting, having voted in this new administration, will say, you have six years. So let's start from day one, uh, not fi trying to figure out what to do but to implement what needs to be done. One of uh, the, the incoming members of the cabinet asked me a very direct question, uh, which was, you know, if you were to expedite the infrastructure blockages in this country, particularly in Metro Manila, what should we do? I said, you just dust off the master plan that exists here because it, it, it exists through many development partners and just say, we'll, we'll, we'll fill in the blanks, we'll mm. do it. Mm. Why hasn't those? Why haven't those plans been executed in the past? For a whole host of reasons, I think government procurement ha has uh, had problems here in terms of uh, of transparency, in terms of a limited number of uh, bidders. Uh, some of it restricted by law, some of it by in level of confidence people have, right. and sometimes sweet deals. You know, where right. where you, uh, you know, it was never quite as transparent as it should be. There was also nervousness about funding. Right. You know, do you how much do you borrow? Uh, to do what you have to do, you know, having uh, achieved credit worthiness, do you then blow it by, uh, by uh, uh, reckless borrowing? Then there's this other issue, which I think is is going to challenge uh, the future administration as much as the past, which is that for many things there is a global price for whether it's energy, whether it's a railway system, a train engine, or a, uh, an aircraft, whatever. These are globally set prices. Right. Now, if you're going to then recoup those that investment over a, a, a 10, 30, 20, 30 year period, the mm. fares that people have to pay, the fees mm. that people have to pay, mm. are way above what the minimum wages of, uh, are in the, in the Philippines. I think Filipinos overall are underpaid yeah. for what they do. Uh, there are people who are in domestic service, for example, that I know of, who have not had a pay rise since they joined the family establishment. Uh, it's still 2,000 pesos per month. Mm -mm. Uh, because they say, well, they've got a place to sleep, I give them clothes to wear, and they have food. This is just to go and see a film or something. Right, right, right. But if that person needs to go to Legaspi to see their, their mother, how far is that 2,000 going to go? And now they're going to go there empty-handed. Right. Uh, so I think this idea that you can employ people on the cheap has had a, a real effect as well. because. It, Typically, I think a journey nowadays in any urban area is probably in the region of 300 pesos, really, which is the minimum wage yeah. in its entirety. Are you yeah. going to spend 100% of your daily wage just getting to and from work? But that is the benchmark. I don't see how you can create a situation. That, now, how do you get around that? Well, you get around that by doing what we did in the UK a long time ago, which we no longer have to do. Mm. In the UK, if you worked in a big city like London, your employer would, had to give you what was called a London allowance and a London waiting, mm -hmm. which by a miracle was equivalent to your uh, season ticket mm -hmm. for your travel. Mm -hmm. uh, so the employers knew from day one that if you didn't give your employee the money to get to work, they weren't, they weren't going to come to work. Now, now it's just factored into the salary. Everybody knows that to work in Manchester, Glasgow, or, or London, that's what you need. So. If you're working in, in Makati or in Quezon City or right, wherever, right. every employer should know, well, how, you know, to get here from uh, Laguna or from uh, Bulacan or from another part of, uh, of Metro Manila, uh, how much does it cost? Well, that's, it's not a, a gift, it's a, a given, you just add it to the salary. Do you see these things changing? I mean, is this... I tell you why I'm, I'm confident it will change, because that has, you've seen in every country that's on the path that the Philippines is. If once you're in a fast-developing track, and this is where the, the country is lucky, 
Yeah. You know, it is now certainly one of the fastest growing countries in the region. Yes. Uh, Surpassed it, China yeah, this, which this is quarter, amazing. which is incredible, yeah. Uh, and you have uh, a median age of 24, so the productivity that you have a largely educated uh, workforce, although improvements there yeah. can be made. Human capital here is good. Yeah. Uh, there's a bit of a trade-off between consume, consumption and investment. I think the balance is slightly skewed towards consumption, but that does generate a certain amount of, of wealth. But right. uh, but effective investment would actually make that multiplier bigger. Now, what, what that means is that the, unlike other countries which, who are ravaged by all sorts of other difficulties, here there is essentially the, most of the, the, of the tools are in the toolkit. It's a question of how you mm, use how them. How you put it together, yeah. So, well, uh, let me go back to what we started talking about, which is social media. One of the things we also saw was this tremendous anger, anger unleashed. Actually, I don't think we've had as vitriolic uh, an election campaign season as, as this one. And it still continues online now. I mean, this week I'm watching from overseas, we have President-elect Duterte speaking, and he says some things. It's taken, people take offense at it, and you have all these this anger online. I mean, are you surprised by this? How do you think this will play out? I think, again, this is something that's a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll recall before the, that anger used to spill out on the streets in the Reformasi in, yes, uh, in, in Indonesia. Indonesia. Right. Uh, what we saw in Poland many years ago yes. when we had the transformation from the, the communist set up to, to now. I think people have now realized that you, you can channel that, that de desire to, to lodge your protest or your view in a very different way. They've understood the power of social media. They've understood the power of, of, of the vote. Um, and, and this time they've shown here in a very, very clear way uh, that, it, that you have to address those concerns. So the agenda is no longer being set by the candidate. That's interesting. Um, President Duterte has a very clear, he, had, he came out with three priorities, anti-crime, anti-corruption, and good governance. Um, and yet the way he, this plays out, uh, the selection of the cabinet, we've, that's the most transparent we've ever had in terms of choosing it. The way it's been playing out is people get a part of it, but yet it's also, again, become quite uh, disparate. I mean, it's, it's in so many different channels. There's not the sense of everyone actually talking to each other about it. They're talking at or yelling at each other. Um, yeah. I think, firstly, you know, the, the business of running an administration is a huge challenge for anybody. Uh, people remember the iconic Margaret Thatcher. Yes. Uh, as soon as she became Prime Minister for the first time, going to see the Queen in Buckingham Palace, she came back, and, and we have a, a gentleman called the Cabinet Secretary, yes. who's a, a civil servant. And Margaret Thatcher turned to the Cabinet Secretary and said, uh, so where do I begin? And the response from him was, perhaps, Prime Minister, you should start forming a cabinet. You know, so it's, this is not unique, this yeah. idea of, of yeah. getting your, your people around you, addressing the issues, uh, and in this day of, of an age of, of focus from, from day one, a lot of things that were done in dark smoke filled rooms is now being done in the open. And as candidate uh, 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 Mr. Duterte said that he wanted freedom of expression, he wanted more transparency and open government. And in a way, when you're transparent and open, you, you've got to take it as it is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not the total varnish product yet. Um, soon enough, when people sit on the, behind their desks and these issues start to come one at a time, uh, that, that, that discipline and that, that focus will, will come because it has to come. And one of the, the issues here in the Philippines, which I noticed because of the way the system is, far too many decisions go to the president. Yes. Way too Almost many. Almost everything, yeah. Um, I don't think our prime minister has ever signed a contract or seen a contract in his entire period in office. Wow. He, may, he will set the overall guidelines. Right, he will know right, what, right. what he wants, but the line ministers take care of all of these things. Right. Uh, and even the line ministers will rely on his officials to get, get the, the nitty gritty correct. The idea that a president sits through line by line, as I saw President Aquino do, and, I'm, I was, and President Duterte will have to do in his time, you know, do we need three of these? And uh, wouldn't two be enough? And should it be from country X or Y? Uh, should it be made out of steel or concrete? Um, these micro man decisions going all the way to the executive. And this is where I gain some uh, uh, optimism. Uh, when I met uh, candidate Duterte two days before he decided to run for, for president in Davao, I spent three hours with him 
uh, just talking. And oh, interesting. And he expressed the style with which he ran the city, which was to say that he he picked the people he wanted, and he just said, "This is these are the aims." When you when you say if it's crime, if it's about public service and, and delivery, and simply said, "Now go and do it." Now, if he runs his cabinet in the same way, I think we will see a, a big change where it, you won't have the section of the DPWH or the DND and others keep going back and forth to Malakanyang and then waiting to see whether the president's finished reading every single document. He will say, "If does it deliver what I asked you to deliver, go ahead. What impression of the man did you get in those three hours you spent with him? Well, in terms of ideology, you know, it, it, in the Philippines, it, it's, it's not quite the same as what I'm, I've been used to in other places, yes. where, where you, you know, your party label, et cetera, you, you carry. But here I saw somebody who was left-leaning, um, uh, something akin to a, a social democrat, because he's pro-business, but pro-poor. Right, right. And that, I think, is, is an agenda that had to, had to arrive here. In a country where a quarter of the population live under internationally defined lines of poverty, in some places I've been to, it's as high as 70. In, in parts of Leyte and, 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 and in the outlying parts of, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Muslim South. Um, there are people I have come across, particularly during Yolanda, it wasn't that they needed help uh, from our medical team, it's that they've never seen a doctor in their lives. Mm. That sort of deprivation, stunted growth, infant uh, mortality, um, um, women dying in, in childbirth, two to three uh, pregnant women in, in uh, uh, in hospital beds, you know, these are fundamental human requirements that have to be met, and they have to be met by uh, government policy addressing these these needs. Progress has been made, but I think again, uh, some, somebody needs to turn that dial up, and things have to be developed, uh, delivered at a higher pace. I saw that coming through, right? Uh, that 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 passion for change. So when you go back to what you're saying, that uh, his views on corruption, crime. Uh, and, and good governance. Good governance. Yeah. We share those aims, and right. we have the, the very same issues. Uh, you know, the, the the issues with 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 uh, drugs and people trafficking is right. not just a Philippine issue; it's a it's a British issue. The the issues with about terrorism uh, in, in in the south, in with the the right. NPA legacy, etc. You know, we have homegrown yes. terrorists right. that we are dealing with. Um, so. Good governance, you know, we, we have finally got to a point in the UK, we haven't removed corruption, but we've made it socially and culturally unacceptable. Uh, people's careers as politicians, as businessmen and others have been completely ruined overnight. I've almost never recovered uh, from misdemeanors of a very low order. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the amounts of money are in the UK when they come out are, are embarrassingly small, but the reaction is, 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 is huge. Um, so these are universal challenges that come up. I think where we are likely to have uh, uh, differences are the means yeah. to an end. I mean, the UK has consistently an, an, uh, opposed capital punishment, and we will do so uh, going forward. It doesn't matter whether it's in Washington, Beijing, Singapore, or in, in Manila. Uh, we will argue against it because of, for two reasons. One is it doesn't work. You know, if capital punishment was going to cure the, the, the disease, we would have no crime in Indonesia uh, or uh, the murder rate in the United States would be significantly lower, lower. than it is. Right. The other one is an issue of conscience. What would you do if you were the person who decided to execute somebody and then later on found out through they DNA, etc., they were innocent? I, yeah. I think you would carry that to your own grave forever, that you took somebody's life. You know, I, w I wanted to move on, but this is still so interesting. Uh, uh, Mayor Duterte, or, or now President-elect Duterte, says that the, what the Philippines needs is a strong, a strong man. Like it's it's almost uh, a strong leader, uh, the taunt in the Cold War period. You now, what you need is a, a, a leader who's determined, mm. determined to succeed, determined to motivate his people, to set a climate where people don't even think about doing something wrong. Uh, where you don't want to hang around with a beer in your hand at uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, where, where you don't... Because hopefully uh, you have a job. Yeah. <laughs> where you don't har harass people just because they've chosen to wear clothing of the, that they, they think is, is fashionable and, cor and correct. Um, that you, you don't disturb your neighbors with your version of my way. 
at uh, 3 a.m. in the morning. The yeah. national anthem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can do that by shaping behavior. You don't have to go to draconian measures. But let's look at it another way. Sometimes you do need a, a determination of a different kind. Let's say we're all talking about the need for infrastructure. We need railway Perfect. lines, we need right, uh, right, roads, right. etc. Well, that road has to go through somebody's backyard. And traditionally, people say, not in my backyard, but, uh, but we need this, this wonderful right. road. Now, what you do, you do it lawfully. You, yeah. you, you pass laws. And my, my advice to the incoming de uh, de uh, Secretary for Transport is, instead of having piecemeal approvals, go to the Senate and Congress with your master plan. Say, in the thir in, between now and the 30 years, this is what the Philippines will build and deliver. These are the terms for compensation. These are the appeal processes. Right. These are the, the, the boundaries by which contracts will be held. The answer, therefore, to any bidder who fills in that, uh, that grid is yes. Mm. That's great. So, so that way, you're not actually doing it in, in the way which is Piece the dicta dictatorial and, right, way, where right. the bulldozer comes and knocks you down. And you, I'm sure right. you've seen pictures right, right. where there's this last house standing and the motorway is built ar around, around them. I mean, yeah. that, that is not how things are done. I mean, it, in, in the UK, we have the same issue that you have about our, our capital's airport. Right, right. Very, very controversial, controversial issue. So much so much that, that nobody even wants to press that button saying, do we build a new airport or do we add another runway to Heathrow? A radioactive political issue. But the, in the end, when it is done, it will be done through processes that are transparent. But what you cannot do is bulldoze half a village in West London and say, sorry, guys, you know, uh, the strong man has taken over and we're, this is what we're going to do. Interesting. Uh, well, you know what? I, a good question just came in on social media. And let, let me throw this to you. This is from Gab Orlina. Thanks for your question. How has social media changed the political landscape of the UK and how can it possibly change the Philippines? Yeah. Well, let me start with close to home. Uh, you know, why am I on Twitter? Well, why is our embassy on Facebook? Yeah. Uh, for a whole host of reasons, which is that because by doing our diplomacy in public, uh, we can actually multiply yep. a hell of a lot quicker. In, uh, so that's one obvious example of, right. of how it is different. Whereas previously people have said, we, you know, as ambassador, we were unapproachable, we had protocol, we, people had to call you your excellency, and right, whatever. Right. now people just ping, you know. <laughs> I, and, and I get all sorts of uh, question. Some of them are, you know, somebody asked me to explain the Middle East peace process on Twitter, and I said, if, if the Middle East peace process could be solved in 140 <laughs> characters, we'd have got there a hell of a lot quicker. But it does focus your mind, actually, when yes. somebody says, you know, in a few words, you know, get, give us the essence of, of what's going on. That, that, I think, is one thing that has changed. The other one is, is if I can broaden the question a little sure. bit to service delivery, um, which is that even if you were slightly resistant or you hadn't quite caught up with the technology, once you actually get the idea that through an app, by pressing a few buttons, you can actually get what you want without yes. standing out in the rain, without um, waiting for, for days, without, uh, not, without knowing what other options and choices do I have. So public government service delivery in the UK has, has been transformed. It, it throws up some challenges. I mean, you know, we have 17,000 British people living here in, yeah. in the Philippines. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them are of a, of a, of a generation where it, it predates the invention of uh, mm -hmm. the World Wide Web. Right. Now, you are, we are asking them to renew their passports. Mm -hmm. uh, and the instructions are as though we're talking to a, a tech-savvy individual with a credit card. Uh, now, if, if somebody's sitting in, in a far-off uh, island in this wonderful country, they may not have reliable internet. Mm. They may certainly not have a, a, a credit card. And even if they did, they wouldn't trust the machine right. to deliver this vital service. Now, so we had to find a few workarounds, but the, the tide is inevitable. Uh, you know, all our passports are now issued and made in the UK. Uh, before we used to have a little factory in every single embassy. Wow, okay, okay. So as this tide is moving forward, I mean, how do you see what initiatives do you t are you taking here? I mean, obviously, in, in being able to use social media to, to deal with some of the challenges that this administration has faced. Um, the one example I can, I can give you is, 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 is how we've dealt with emergencies yeah. and, and natural uh, yeah. disasters. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, 
I don't know whether I, I'm a magnet for disasters or I'm, <laughs> I'm sent to places where they think I can cope. In Thailand with the, the flood crisis, the red shirt protests, right. etc. when I was ambassador there. Over here, my greeting to the Philippines was the Bohol earthquake, the Zamboanga siege and Yolanda. Um, now, if you use social media, firstly, you can find out very, very quickly what's the situation where. It's yes. a very, very quick, instant readout. I don't have to sort of wait for a journalist to go and discover where the scene of the action is, is coming in live. Secondly, and this um, is, is a, a policy I adopted, which is now our global approach. In a situation of a disaster, we go on social media and say to people, if you're safe, tell your family and friends now. Yes. Because that way I can get rid of all of that traffic into my embassy of, you know, where's Johnny? When yeah, Johnny yeah, can yeah, actually correct. use the use the media and just go back and say, uh, I'm okay. Then we can really start to focus on people who really need need help. And you can get the the, the phone line details out quickly. Mm -hmm. You can tell people, you know, when the my in my last three weeks in Thailand as ambassador, mm -hmm. we had a replica of the. 2004 tsunami warning, exactly the same location, same magnitude of, of quake of Aceh. The only difference was this time the earth moved sideways, not up and down. For three hours, southern Thailand and the, all of the exposed areas, uh, we all went into complete tsunami posture. Social media was absolutely vital. We just got it out there straight away. Uh, and in blunt language, mm, you know, mm. expect a tsunami within the next three hours. And you got feedback immediately. Immediate also, feedback, right? et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used it in many other ways. There was a one period where there was an earthquake in northern, um, the northern border between Burma and, uh, and Thailand. Okay. This was just after Fukushima. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, course. Uh, of course. London you know, yes. heard about the earthquake almost as, as I did. As, yes. And again, I, I, my first response yes. was to go on my Twitter account. Right. First thing I did. Right. And anybody out there in Chiang Mai said, yeah, yeah, the, the, we felt the earth move, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody reported a, an unfortunate uh, uh, elderly lady died because the wall collapsed, but there's no sign of damage right. here at all. By the time the phone rang from London, I was already able to give some level of credibility as to you know, where, where are we. And then came the more detailed question, is, are there nuclear facilities there? Uh, you know, blah, blah, you know, and we went through all of those. Interesting, interesting. Uh, and so what, so what, what does it say? It says that for... Serious things like a like a, a, a civil emergency, through to really out and out fun things. I mean, in, right. in the last Great British Festival, we ran a singing competition where Filipinos could sing their best West End musical. You know, we had five hundred thousand votes. Oh come on, that's great. <laughs> uh, I, I unheard of. Right. Absolutely unheard. Of. Social media capital. What we were here. Um, you know, we we also use. Uh, Agos for disaster risk reduction. We see the same things, mm. the, the, the possibility of doing it. I guess in terms of what we're working on now, how do you see um, technology, social media, how can these be used to jumpstart and deal with age-old problems that this administration is going to be coming to? Let's start with corruption. Yeah, for let's, let's start with that. Let me give you an, an, what I call an analog example and sure. then go to where we are now. Sure. Uh, our aid agency, DFID, worked on a project in India, okay. uh, which was to m allow communities to ha hold their government to account at a local level and a national level. Mm -hmm. What they were given was, were, was data. Okay. How much does it cost to build a, a road right. of a certain length, of, of, of reasonable specifications? And they were told that, that the cost per, per mile is X. Right. They were then asked the government say how much budget has been allocated for our road project in this in this in this town they were told the amount is why very simple calculation that should buy you a mm. uh, hundred miles of road right if at the end of the three-year project somehow or other 30 percent has gone missing instant accountability right now that is what I call the analog way, because somebody's got to go and get the data, somebody's right. got to look at it, somebody's got to go and measure out this thing, et cetera, et cetera. Just imagine the social media thing. Hey, guys, in, in Bacolod, how much was that project? How many, blah, 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 what happened there? Mm -hmm. um, how far has that road got to you? Has it got to you over there here? Uh, who's, who's bidding? Who's winning? You, know, mm -hmm. you go to the websites and you can, you can see what's actually going on. And people you, actually do this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you actually make this whole thing of, of freedom of information come to life because the idea that you have to go and open a dusty c cupboard and pull out a piece of paper mm -hmm. to find bits of information. In, in the UK where we have the Freedom of Information Act, 
it is hard if somebody asks a question which goes back to the period where we didn't have electronic files. Mm, mm. Really hard. Mm, mm. Uh, whereas now, mm. the, the way we've gone about it is actually, I, I find it easier to put it in the public domain already. Yes. Uh, do you want to know what, what I did? Here, here it is. Um, so I think when it comes to um, using social media in the digital age for for transparency, it, it, it is there. For example, if you go through the whole nitty gritty process of, of pr public procurement, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you may find this unbelievable, but you have to accept this as truth. A British company was bidding for a project here in the Philippines, and the initial bid was rejected because the envelope was addressed with block capital letters from start to finish. <laughs> because the instructions showed the address of this, the office to be the first word capital letters, the rest in small letters. I had to then write to the agency and say, uh, can you overlook this misdemeanor and allow the bid to be open? They said, OK, on this occasion, we will do so. Mm. Um, then came this uh, second request uh, in another case where they said uh, the, the bidder has not initial the notarized bid document. Mm. Now there are regulations here. One regulation says contract bid documents have to be notarized. The second one says after it's been notarized it cannot be amended in any way. Oh so the poor people sort of said which way do I go? Do I initially or do I? No, no, let's be safe. It's right. notarized, right. let's not touch this. Right. So I appealed on that one. They said sorry, the appeal is not granted because uh, the document was not in initial. Now, digitize all of that, put it online, put it on the system, you've got your digital signature, you know where it came from, right. uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's, it, and it's transparent. You don't have to have this thing where people sort of sit, sit around and sort yes. of say, I've opened this envelope now. And, and, and yes. Translate that to the elections that we've just seen. Um, I can now, with, without fear, say that uh, Smartmatic is chaired by Lord Mark Malik Brown, a former British minister. Uh, it, the holding company of this whole multi-global uh, institution is, is in the UK. Mm -hmm. And what did you see? Yes, we saw one or two uh, air issues of controversy, but you saw one of the most credible s processes Fox. this country has ever had, fast. Correct, and right. I saw it Large, go yeah. through the five yeah. precincts I visited. Yeah. I saw the output at the PPCRV. Yes. And then you saw one of the fastest uh, proclamations in, in history. Yeah, you saw some of the old-fashioned stuff as well. In some places, the, uh, the volunteers had to leave because they felt unsafe. Right. Uh, there were, uh, but again, because it happened so fast. Yeah, right? but, the, this is the level of violence was, yeah. was less in these elections. But there you see again, uh, this, this whole procurement yeah. was transparent. Yes. Uh, it was challenging because at the 11th hour, there was a ruling that uh, these receipts had to be uh, provided to mm. the voter. Uh, Smartmatic took the decision to offer that for nothing because uh, by the time that went through another bidding, I mean, this whole thing of, what, of repairing the old machines, yes, yes, et cetera, yes, et cetera, yes, yes, this was yes. all done in public. Yes. I'm, I'm more than happy with that. But where, where I disagree, uh, and again, I'm talking about real examples, uh, this country, given its geography, desperately needs bridges. Yes. Now, firstly, there's a, 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 a restriction here that a foreigner contractor cannot build concrete mm. bridges, but they can build steel bridges. Now, okay, rhyme whether you have but... concrete bridges, steel bridges, has a lot to do with your budget, has to do with the span that you're trying to cover ah, and the, the traffic load that you have to have. I see. What would happen in the bad old days is that whilst the project is being put together, et cetera, et cetera, somebody will very quietly slip in concrete bridges only. Mm. So you suddenly look at it and say, Hold on a minute. You know, all of these people came in to bid, et cetera, et cetera, and the small print mm -hmm. says you're I disqualified, see. and that I is see. not transparent procurement. Right, right. Um, and now all of these things, I think, can be done in a way in which there is confidence and accountability for what is what is being done. And um, um, and I, you, you, this is not the only country where my fellow civil servants come up with ingenious ways to trip up service, you know, where you have to have four different processes uh, to achieve 
one thing. People talk about customs, and mm -mm. nowadays people talk about the single window, mm -mm. Mm -mm. where everything is in, in one place, and, and you press a button, you approve it. But uh, you now have a situation here, even to this day, where certain per permits are on paper, they're faxed from the DTI yeah. to the Bureau of Customs, the other things are done online, and you're, this whole hybrid process, but it all needs to come, come, come together. And I think this is where uh, doing things in the open will come. Now, the reason why we, we think that there is a market for using social media to improve uh, government procurement and government expenditure and accountability is that in the end, it is truly open. It's right. not that something you request and you, no. you dig out. It yeah. is there by, by, by default. Fully transparent. I mean, let me give you, uh, again, I, I prefer to use real examples. Yes, yes. Um, we've been told in our system to minimize the use of cash because it's costly to, you know, if I'm going spending money on, uh, on a taxi fare or traveling from A to B, if I keep drawing cash, I'm actually using a very expensive re resource. The government has given me a government credit card, mm. right? Except that any transaction above a certain figure, in our case it's uh, 500 pounds, mm. is automatically displayed. To publicly. To publicly. Wow, that's transparent. Full, full stop. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you then look down and say, ah, so Mr. Ahmed was traveling from here to Hong Kong, he can, he can then follow up and say, why was he in Hong Kong? Yeah. Um, and there are some trip wires. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I say this very carefully. The name of, of the, uh, the merchant on the credit card may not necessarily be the people, that, the shop that you walked into. You could have, for example, yes, yes, a yes. hotel casino. You could go into a place where the, the front says, Hotel, Hotel X, and, but, but the it's back a casino. is casino. Right, so, right, but right. when the thing comes on, it says, you know, Golden Jubilee Casinos. Right, right. So the ambassador is using government money to go to a you know, <laughs> casino. But I mean, joking aside or the trip wires aside, it means that the minute I reach into my pocket, something is already telling me. You're already being held accountable. Uh, you know, am I doing the right thing? Right, right. Um, and and I, I do this even at home here. Uh, you know, when we do a lot of entertainment in, 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 in our residence. And I say to my staff, when you walk out with the government procurement card, don't think it's free money. <laughs> uh, we, we, we call it the Queen's money. It's, it's our own in-house joke. It's a, you know, be careful with the Queen's money. Do you see that level of accountability coming to the Philippines? It, it's, it has to come because, uh, you know, when, when you talk about devolved government, when you talk about federalism, when you talk about barangay level decisions, etc., these big budgets in the end get broken down into micro, micro yes. bits of expenditure. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so if, if you're not watching the centavos, you'll find that when you aggregate the whole thing, it, 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 it doesn't work. So how, yeah. do you, how do you say you're going to be transparent if you don't have that degree of accountability? And it, it's also, I think, uh, it's also a proofing. Um, you know, you were talking to me earlier about why were governments here in, in other places slow? Um, a, a very uh, 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 eminent member of the current cabinet said to me that we have overcorrected. In a sense, we've put in so many safeguards that there, it, it, the, the decision-making process has been strangled. Right. Because what has happened is that if you push it through too quickly and you've done all the right things, right. people will say, he must have got something out of this. Right, right. Uh, well, this was part of the reason in 2011 the, the growth rate was choked because yes, DPWH I, just took a long time to... Yeah, I mean, it was quite astounding that in the aftermath of Yolanda, the government spent less money yes. rather than... Because they were being overly... Yeah, the budget was there. But it was that there, there was this fear that somehow or other there would be leak, leakage because that was the legacy uh, before. Right, right. So one of the things that we are going to embark and work on together is trying to, to stop corruption through crowdsourcing. Yes. I mean, what makes you, what makes, what gives you the faith that that would work in this country? No, firstly, our faith is in Rappler. <laughs> oh my God. That's where it begins because you are our chosen chosen partner. It is because of the way in which you have actually captured this uh, phenomena and made it made it work. You have people who are committed. Uh, individuals, people who are want to engage with these issues. In, mm. in the, they call it civil society, but this is sort of digital civil society. You've yes. got people following the, the, the issues. You, you've also managed to combine two things, which is, in my view, quite unique, that you have a community, mm. but you also have information being fed to that mm. community. You're, you're synthesizing that, and, and the quality of your journalism 
is as good, if not better. Um, the other day, I, I saw your first briefing on the pen picture of the incoming cabinet, and I told my guys, forget about writing this up. I just print me this off. You know, I, I, I can use this as my initial pen picture. So your you, your your community is informed. Mm. But then comes the next part, which is that you know, information by itself is no good. Just right. receiving the information, no good. what do you do with it? Right. And what you do with it is where we are really want to take this, this project. So if, uh, once we get this up and running, if people are able to report in real time, hey, they said this project was going to happen in this school. There isn't a school here. Correct. Uh, yes. Um, and that is, again, it's not a fictitious example. Yes. There are many, um, apart from ghost employees, there are ghost buildings. Yes. Uh, or sometimes the, the data is, is the Department of Health. It wasn't that the, in many instances that we faced during Yolanda. Yes. They, in all honesty, thought that there was a clinic. We'd get there and there is no clinic. There never has been a clinic. It's somewhere else. Wow. Uh, so, empowered with this information, you, you then bring this in. And then I think you also get, uh, a, this is where, again, your analytics come in. If you consistently get the same noise from that same community time and time and time again, it cannot be one disgruntled right. individual. Right. It cannot be just one person having a go at the mayor because he wants to be the next mayor. Right, right. Uh, you know, there's verification yes. coming through. Yes. That said, the rules are not suspended. You know, you're still, you know, if you make a false accusation, yes. if, you're, you know, if you go into the Senate and say, my only evidence is I read it in the daily newspaper, <laughs> Really. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, the number of times w over here where I see judicial inquiries and, 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 and the kind of congressional ones where this, this, this discipline of evidence based uh, uh, attestations is, is not as strong. I mean, in the UK, my God, you know, I've appeared before our, our parliamentarians. It is the most frightening experience of, of a civil servant. Right. Um, because you know that either you, what you say uh, you're going to be held to account right. or you have to make a pledge that you will go back and furnish that information if it's right. not. But what you do not do is make it up as you go along. So I think that's why we want to work with you. We, we, we want to see whether uh, by, by using the, the, the constituency that you've developed uh, and the techniques that you have, we can actually bring to life accountability. Yes. Well, th and this is part of the reason I remain optimistic about social media because we've seen it. Like we've actually seen uh, people report to us a tree in the middle of a road, for yes. example, um, and levels of engagement, levels of, of reporting, of yeah. crowdsourcing. We call it. Right? I mean, I remember um, a journey I made was very early on. Uh, I, I went for the very f my first long road trip was to the province of La Union. And as I was going up, there was a lot of road works going on, and I saw these big ancient trees being chopped down. And I thought, my goodness me, what a terrible, terrible thing. You almost felt like weeping for every tree mm. that, you, mm. that you saw. And then when I started r looking on, on social media, etc., there were other people who were concerned. Then mm. the, they discovered that the, even the one that was standing had been ringed, so they were going to die anyway. Mm. And, and I realized I wasn't alone in my, my, my concern. Now, that is what we are talking about, which right. is that, you know, yes, I could be this one lone individual driving down the thing feeling for an unnecessary uh, uh, act against Mother Nature. But when I turn around and say, well, actually, there are thousands of people who feel the same who way. Think? Then you turn around and say, who made this decision? Right. Who decided to do this rather than route the road somewhere else? Was there another way of, of, of delivering it? Or what is going to actually, <laughs> a more important question, given that the crime had already been committed against the Mother Nature. What's, who's, what's going to happen with this lumber? Right. If it was going to be chopped up and used for people who are homeless and uh, have a new home, you could say, okay, that was a bad thing, but we got some good out of a bad thing. And that's where I think that things can, can really uh, develop. Then we go to the world of um, what I call the app world. Okay, uh, go. My goodness me. I am <laughs> really like increasingly find myself out of my depth. Um, but as a dumb user of, of, of a smartphone, you know, you suddenly realize that you're not just using a, a navigation tool. Yes. You know, by just using those mysterious buttons that then pop up, you know where the nearest public service is, the nearest hospital is, the nearest uh, uh, public convenience, if you're lucky enough to find one in the Philippines, is. Uh, you know, it, you become information rich. Yes. 
through very, very simple application. And then where this crowdsourcing comes in is that nowadays a lot of the input and the data comes from your fellow traveler. Correct. Correct. And that is, I think, the, the, the real change. And, I, and I, I look at it and I, I know it's there and sometimes it's scary, but you sort of think, surely that is what is the future of, of public service delivery, that, that the end user is, is actually guiding you as to how they, how they want to be served. Whereas the old way is, you know, we've set this up and here are the gateways and the, right. and the forms. And if you've actually, well, it's one like one of those computer games, you know, when you get to level five, we might give you the, the thing that's in this yes. box. Yes. Whereas the other way around is that they might say, we don't want that box. Right. But we want this instead. We want this. Because if we have that, we don't even need this, this box. That, that, you know, because what I actually want is an outcome, not the, the fulfillment of this wonderful English phrase that you use, the Philippines, which we don't use, when you accomplish a form. <laughs> I mean, I, I can now understand why people <laughs> use the, it is an accomplishment by, <laughs> by George, you know, when you, when you get through, through these things. Um, you know, when people are making a, a, a journey, they really want to get to the destination, right. not those horrible steps in the, in, the, in the middle. They take that as given. So let me ask you, for this government now coming in, if you were to choose the top three priorities, what would they be? The first one is to really bring to life the sectors that have been neglected, agriculture, tourism, uh, so that this push for people to mi migrate to urban uh, centers or to go abroad is, is not going to change overnight, but that's, that has to be the first true area of focus. And mm. the, the, the actual potential here is huge. Again, I use the Thailand-Philippines yes, example. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there is nothing that I've seen grown in Thailand that cannot be grown here. But uh, uh, I have to be careful how I phrase this. Uh, the, the, the fruits here look a little bit wretched and miserable. <laughs> Why? What so they need mean? a makeover. You know, they need to look appetizing. They need to look correct for the supermarket world of you know, they can't have black spots. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and, and one, you know, you need to grade the products in such a way uh, that, that, that they reach the marketplace. Uh, you know, the, the Europe is, is hungry for, for produce from uh, Southeast Asia. But we just, the, the, the mechanism of getting that product from A to B. A mango here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, even your best ones. Uh, uh, in, uh, they, they probably sell at 30 pesos a kilo or something mm -hmm. in the local marketplace. Mm -hmm. Somebody will pay you 40 pesos per mango Over yes. overseas. Yes, yes, and in yes. Tokyo, for a, a, the perfect mango, they'll pay you $10 US. I've, I've so seen getting that. it to yeah. the right so, market. So tourism, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Agriculture, that is one, one big, big sector. The second one is what we've been talking about, which is infrastructure. Because uh, you, you cannot have uh, the, the connectivity of goods and, and, and services and, and, and people, if they can't get from the, the field to the, the nearest market, mm. from the market to the nearest regional hub, from the regional hub to the, to the global uh, marketplace. And that, there, is no, there are no shortcuts. Yeah. And in, in a way, uh, uh, even when uh, a city like the Manila had the opportunity to fix it, they didn't. You took a look at Bonifacio uh, Global City. Yes. A complete brownfield exercise. You could have had the cheapest urban tramway and light rail rail railway system in this region. Now the only option is the most expensive, which is to bore tunnels yes. and, and, and do this. Fine. I mean, we know we've rebuilt Heathrow in its own location. Uh, it's an old airport that is now modern and shiny. Um, Gatwick Airport actually has, has one runway fewer than Naia, but it handles more traffic mm. than, than this airport here. Um, I've been coming in and out of the Philippines now for the best part of uh, 14 years. And each time I've come, EDSA has got worse because they've been trying to improve it. Why? It's because there are now more reasons to go to EDSA than there, were, there was 14 years ago. Yes. Uh, we didn't decongest. No. We, con you, we made it. Yeah. We funneled them yeah. to the same. And the, the next connection of the, the north and south highway will, will go straight through this whole, the, the, this, this one thoroughfare yet again. Um, so infrastructure is the, the second block. The third one is education. Interesting. Because what is happening over here is that uh, the, the qualifications here become devalued. 
you know, you, you almost need a college degree to make coffee. Simply because employers can set that bar over there. Mm -mm. Uh, I've also seen things that, you know, where, where the supply and demand is out of kilter. You know, there are people who go to, because they've, they've watched uh, Be Careful With My Heart on TV or whatever, <laughs> they, they want to be a flight attendant. It's a passion of many people here. There are colleges that exploit that passion. There are thousands of people uh, going through that process of, 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 and what they don't realize is that 99% of the airlines don't want a flight attendant trained by somebody else. Yeah. They, want to do, they want to do the training. What they want are people who have those basic competences of being articulate, being uh, quick on their feet, being right. Uh, right. You know, those sort of things. So over here you get what I call narrow funneling of people at an early age. You get qualifications which are not, are, 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 are not developing the right sort of skills that people need. I mean, if you take the, the, the terrific set of reports that you have now, they're out there in the field. Many of them are actually quite young. Yes, very young. Uh, yeah. uh, and having to deal with all sorts of issues of, of the day. Now, if they went to some traditional school of journalism and went through the, all of that, by the time they squirt, the system squirted them out over here, they'll be terrified of doing an assignment yes. that, that you're sending them out on. Whereas if you sort of say, OK, so what's your history? What do you, do you feel passionate about? How do you deal with objections? Uh, what do you do with you know, problem solving and, and right, those right, are right. resilience? And, and then you set them out there. You know that uh, the rest you can train. OK, you have to have some facility with the language and some dexterity when it comes to the technology that you've got to do. So education here, I think, has to change in a very dramatic way. And I think this is where people like us can help. Yes. Because right now, rather absurdly, the constitution of the Philippines bans a foreign teacher from teaching regularly. You can have workarounds, etc., and exceptions are made for places like the British school. Right. But the, 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 sc the school mix has to remain tight. But you cannot legally work here as a tenured professor or, uh, in a, in if a, you're a in foreigner. foreigner. The old fear is, oh, well, you'll take over my, our jobs. The only institution that was given an exemption was a, the Asian Institute of Management. 81% mm -hmm. of the faculty are Filipino. Mm -hmm. right, so if it's uh, something that's going to take away jobs, it just isn't there. Right, right. And by doing that, what you also then do is you do something quite dramatic. The, there are many great universities here, and you see the great rivalries, whether it's basketball or, or people sort of say, which batch mate, where did you go to Athenae or La Salle, et cetera. That's a, almost like the initial calling card that people exchange over here. But in global terms, the ranking of these universities is low. Yes, uh, and yes. for very, one very simple reason, is because one of the great criteria is, is research, research output correct, and correct. innovation. Now, how do you do that if you've got kids who have got two years less education than the, the, the great researchers. Yeah. And then you go into a university where really for the first two years you're given this endless buffet of short courses. Right. Uh, so by the time you come out of it, you know a little bit about everything, but not a great deal about something. Um, the Chimney Scholars that we send from here. I was uh, bring you know, we, we, yeah, when yeah, I yeah. arrived here, we had eight. Now my target this year uh, is 30. And if a few of my corporate friends chip in, we can get to that 30 very easily because we, we've, we've trebled our funding. Yeah. Do you know, not a year goes by where we don't have someone in the batch who actually finishes their masters in the UK with a distinction from the Philippines. So there isn't a problem with the, what's between in, in, in the brains trust yes. of students it's here. It's the opportunity. It's the opportunity. And why shouldn't this place be a, a, a country that just uh, is not one where you replicate and imitate, but you, you actually generate uh, ideas? Uh, it, it, it should. It should. Gra in graphic design, I've seen it happen already to some extent. Uh, but actually, I'll probably upset a lot of people now. But if you look at the, the traditional arts of, of painting, most of the works I see, they're, they almost remind me of how things used to be in the 60s uh, in other oh. countries. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's very sort of block abstract. It's, they're repeating something that they were taught somewhere. Yes. Uh, rather than just letting go, you know. Right. Um, uh, but people are doing this now more and more, and when, when they have the aid of, uh, of, of graphic design packages and, and, and machines, because you can actually play around uh, a lot more.
Oh, fantastic. So those three points that you made are the biggest challenges and then moving forward. Our topic is inclusive growth, I guess. In terms of how you see this new government, GDP went up, but the trickle down didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. What's the key thing that needs to happen now? Well, the key thing is that growth has to be real when people feel it. Mm. You can't just proclaim it as statistic. It's a bit like inflation. It, it, you know, it, one person in inflation is, doesn't uh, match somebody else. If, you're, if your bulk of your expenditure is in rice right. and, and, and fuel, then the fact that uh, the, the, the cost of a commodity that you can't even dream of purchasing has risen and yet it's in the, in the basket of, of, for evaluation. Is, is, so you've got to feel yep. uh, what's happening. That's number one. The other one is that the, the projects that are, are announced, they actually have to deliver the outcome that they were designed for. Let's take transportation. If you say we're going to build a railway that connects uh, uh, Manila to uh, Sorsogon, that's on, on paper, you say that that's the, that, that's the project. Right. But what you've got, got to be able to actually add on that is that, and as a result of that, your journey time will reduce from 18 hours to three. If at the end of this period, your journey time is 10 hours, mm. then you, you've really not created that, this is an, an, really an analogy for, for inclusive growth. Until that you feel the impact, it is not real. Agree. And the other thing is that there are some base absolute levels of inclusiveness that, that this country has to pass the threshold of. Let me start with something very basic. If you do not have access to your own toilet and your bathing facilities, you will never feel included. Yeah. How can you feel included when you don't even like yourself, let alone how you're going to interact with the, with the rest of society? Right. So it, it starts with those those core essential human needs. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at almost the hierarchy of needs, you really do start here at the bottom of that pyramid. Right. right. Uh, although now Wi-Fi has been added as a as an essential uh, part of that uh, that pyramid. So, basic healthcare, the day you're born, or how you're looked after, the mm -hmm. immunization programs. You know, mm -hmm. I actually participated in, in an immunization program where, where Prince Charles actually donated part of the vaccine, also for the MMR. Mm -hmm. When the project was finished, even though we provided 40% of the vaccine, there was still a 40% gap in, in actual distribution overall. And you sort of scratch your head. Before we came in to, to assist, the, the government was already committed to 100% vaccination. Right. We provide 40% of it, and yet we're still short. <laughs> what happened? So it did. It simply, the, 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 the resources that were used to chase down the kids was was uh, was not targeted. You go there to find that the kid is with an, a non-registered uh, carer, so you didn't have permission to vaccinate. The, 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 mm. They don't no longer live here. They moved somewhere else. I mean, the whole thing was okay. was just they were chasing their tails, and and then people could not confirm where there was a granny looking after a tiny kid, whether they had already been vaccinated or not. And you know, the people then stopped short. Said, "Well, do I can I double vaccinate a, a, a child?" And by the time these micro decisions are made, you, you add it all up and you end up with a situation where it's not, not, not been developed. But then, you know, when, when entire segments of your community are excluded, and this is where you see the, the, the difficulties in the, in the Muslim South, where because of, of insecurity, because of historical legacy, entire communities are, are not included. Uh, you know, by definition from day one, you're saying you don't belong to us. Yes. Uh, that has to be bridged. Indigenous people. Right. Um, in one of my articles here, I said is, is I find it uh, interesting that an, an indigenous pe person squatting in uh, Tondo is looked at with great fear, uh, and they have to be removed from sight. But if they wear tribal dress and they, they mm -hmm. dance for you, that's exotic. It's the same person. Right. Uh, so th there are different ways of of including people and I think there's a this is a long-standing legacy that has to be put right here where, where it really if you're if you are a, a national of the Philippines no matter what gender you are transgender whether you are atypical or untypical whether you're Muslim Catholic or atheist you have you have, to. you have you have a right to live your life the way you choose 
Uh, I, I can't let you go without just asking about this last thing, which you also have gone through. So aside from the climate change, which I know you, you focused on, is uh, watching the peace agreement mm. fall apart. I mean, uh, inclusive, you talked about all of the other things, Muslim in Denial. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's fallen apart. i tell you why I don't think it's fallen apart. This is the first time I heard a candidate and then the winner uh, actually say this was a commitment from day one. And he said it in a way which I've never heard uh, another candidate say. He narrated the history of injustice. He did know it. Yeah, he knows from, this well. You know, what did the Philippines look like before Magellan came here? Right. It was no different to Indonesia, Malaysia, and the rest of, the, of this part of the world. Um, and he, I didn't hear him uh, come up with the, the traditional invocation. He actually recited in Arabic that God was great. And I, I really had to do a double take. That, am I really hearing somebody in the center of Metro Manila yes. in his final campaign speech reaching out to, the, to this community? He wasn't worried about the backdrop, who was behind him. There, yeah. were, there were people who were clearly of, of, of different faiths. Now, so in that sense, um, I don't think it's fallen apart. I think you now actually have uh, another leader uh, beyond President Aquino, who is committed to delivering it. I think what will happen here is that he will look at the, some of the, uh, the, uh, the statements that were made, rightly or wrongly, uh, some of his misplaced, but who was included in the, in, in the deliberations, who, who felt excluded. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe if you take our experience in, in other places of peace building, in Northern Ireland, for example, where former terrorists now govern together side by side, is that you've got to make that tent a bit bigger. Right and bring people into the tent so that they're, they're signed up to it. There was a danger, for example, in the way the old process was going, where the ARMM was, uh, administration, you were almost, it was almost like a deep bathification idea that, that if you're a member of that, you, were, you didn't have a place in, in, in the future. And we talked to our friends and said, do you really want to make that mistake? Yes. Uh, people work in this administration because they're teachers, because they're service providers. You cannot tell me that each and every one of them has been, has been tainted. And actually there's been a complete reversal of that. There's, the, the RMM is now very much supportive of, of the process. I think there are parts of the MNLF that one could reach out to. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some challenges there. And then, the, then what do you do with the people who, are, who really are, have written themselves out of the plot in terms of being simply you know, uh, as their war against humanity? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have no place. In, 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 uh, other than to change their ways one way or another. You're talking about extremists, the ones who are actually allied or have committed yeah, ISIS? Thought, yeah, the, 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 well, the pseudo-ISIS right, people. Right, you know, they, right. Just because you dress up in black doesn't make you a fearsome character, it just makes you an idiot. Um, the, but in doing shaping this, I think what I also hear is that I think the, the indigenous people felt somehow marginalized, and I think they need to be given a clear space. Some of the more, tr more traditional uh, uh, clan leaders, whether they claim royal descent or other, whether they agree or disagree, I think mm -hmm. that there needs to be a way of, of finding a space for them where they can, through the ballot box, find uh, a place in, in what might emerge as, as a government. But also people who might feel that they're a threatened minority within the whole. And here, you know, there should be great cause for hope. I sat down and had one of the most charming dinners I've ever had. Cardinal Quevedo in, in Cotabato City he actually sat down and made me my dinner. And right at the end, he actually uh, tempted me into doing something I rarely do, which is to have dessert, because he said, uh, I, this is my favorite ice cream. So, and he then explained something to me. He said, you know, most of the community are Muslim, and, and they all go to missionary schools. And I said, yes, my first school was a, a convent, my, and I went to a Jesuit school in Japan. So this is not unusual for people of different faiths to have had that education. He said, with that sort of legacy, thankfully we don't actually have an interfaith dispute drawn on religious lines, which we had in Northern Ireland where it was Protestants against Catholics. What we actually have are people who simply have been written out of the project, who need to be written in, back into it. Fantastic. So I think there's, there's, there's a this tent needs to include people who might find themselves in uh, either in a federal state that has a, uh, a, a larger sort of Muslim feel and tradition behind it or accommodation behind it. And I think that it can be done. But I tell you where I think this, this debate needs to broaden. Because you cannot ghettoize the problem as a, as a, as a, as a southern Mindanao and Sulu yes. Archipelago problem. The problem is here in Metro Manila. People change their names mm. so that they're not uh, identified as, as Muslim. Muslim women complain that taxis will go straight past them. 
if they're wearing a hijab because they might choose to go to a part of town that they don't want to go to. Um, I asked the education uh, uh, department officials. Uh, they didn't realize wh where I was leading to my question. I said, uh, what accommodation do you make for different faith groups in schools? And they thought I was talking about Mindanao. I said, oh, but, you know, we, we do this and that. I said, no, no, what about in Metro Manila? I said, well, I said, well, how do you start your day? Is it national anthem and then the invocation of mass? And I said, so I said, what about the Muslim kids? Mm -hmm. um, there, there's no con concept here that uh, that you actually have to create a situation where people of all kinds of orientation are, feel included. Um, it's, you know, there are countries like the United Kingdom where the Queen is the head of the Church of England. We don't make no pretense about the fact that uh, there is a role for faith in our system of, of government. And yet we have the most multi-faith, multi-ethnic uh, communities in, 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 in the world. Um, and it's all happening there. The mosques are being built in former uh, bars and public houses, would you believe? Because that's an available space. The, here you have the, the, the specter of the constitution separating the church and state. Yes. And I've yet to walk into a secretary's office where I don't see the church being represented. I don't think saying, say it's a bad thing, but I'm saying be honest. Yes. Uh, if that is what defines this country, act accordingly, but find space to include everybody else, including, as I say, people of, who choose to profess no faith whatsoever. Fantastic. This is, um, I think we've hit a lot of the key themes in the next, next week. Thanks. Your last thoughts, uh, Mr. Ambassador, as we start Yeah, my, my, my last thoughts are one of genuine optimism. Uh, you know, people are saying, so we voted for change, are we going to get change? Uh, will, will the, when, you know, if patience and forgiveness has run out, is it going to be replaced by, by even something even worse? Are we, are, yes. are we unleashing a storm? And there is actually great fear, right? I mean, particularly with the statements of uh, President-elect Duterte about the murder, rationalizing the murder of journalists. Yep. In, in, yeah, in, in our case, you know, we're going to start the meter from the 30th of June, because that's when, that's he, when he begins. That's when he is president of this country. Right. And then I also have a legitimate grounds to express what my government's policies are and how they might differ with this government's policy. Whereas if I say something prematurely, you'll say to say, I'm talking to my friends in, my, in a bar. What do you, what's it got to do with you? Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I'm, I'm saying all of this is that when we chose the Philippines as part of a pack of 36 countries globally, uh, which we defined as emerging powers, we said that within a 30-year period, this country would be economically strong, it would have a voice in global issues, and may be a, a force to reckon with in, in terms of its intellectual horsepower and ability to influence, that it would, there, the social capital, human capital here was something that we could interact with, borrow, and invest in. Uh, on pure commercial terms, you know, the number one investor here from the EU uh, our sales here rose by 38%, you know, a lot at yes. stake. Yes. My embassy is twice as big as the one I inherited two, uh, three, three years ago, from 100 to 200 people. Uh, the last cabinet minister to visit this country was 20 odd years ago, 1997. I've had three in my time. Uh, the Queen's eldest daughter, the Queen celebrating her 90th year uh, anniversary this year. Um, her daughter returned here after a gap of uh, 16 years, inspecting projects that she initiated and watched as, sa as the president of Save the Children. So I don't want to be pro and wrong. The British government could not have placed its ships on the Philippines over a 30-year period without that sense of real optimism, not based on foolhardy expectations. It would be terribly embarrassing for me to make that, to have made that wrong call. And so far, in my three years here, the Philippines has more than lived up to it our expectations. It has exceeded them in, in most respects. There are difficult challenges globally, uh, you know, if you talk about migration, if you talk about natural yeah. disasters, top poverty, disease, new things that are creeping up, uh, peacekeeping around the world. You know, we've carried the burden uh, sometimes alone, but we have partners now in, in, and we can look to the Philippines as, as one of those. So we have a very, very rich list of things that we are engaging with and want to engage with, which is why uh, uh, you know, even in this period, I've, uh, I've, 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 we're pounding the beat. I've met many of the incoming secretaries. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who I know from my first visit here some 14 years ago who are still around, players. Mm -hmm. And that helps. You know, it gives us a, a, a sense of, of context as well. 
So it's not blind optimism. It, this is grounded on what we, the best analysis that we can put our minds to. That is really good to hear. Optimism that's grounded on reality, on analysis. That's coming from British Ambassador to the Philippines, Asipaman. Thank you so much for speaking with us. And you have to continue the conversation online. He is here for another year. He's on Twitter, yes. at Asif Ahmad. No, Asif, a, at Asif A. Ahmad. At Asif A. Ahmad. So join us. Keep, keep the conversation going. I'm Maria Rasa. Thanks.